Hear the word of the Lord as it was through the prophet Ezekiel and then through his servant Paul. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, when the house of Israel lived in their own land, they defiled it by their ways and their deeds. Their ways before me were like the uncleanness of a woman in her menstrual impurity. So I poured out my wrath upon them for the blood that they shed in the land, for the idols with which they had defiled it. I scattered them among the nations, and they were dispersed through the countries. In accordance with their ways and their deeds, I judged them. But when they came to the nations, wherever they came, they profaned my holy name, in that people said of them, These are the people of the Lord, and yet they had to go out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel profaned among the nations to which they came. And from the Apostle Paul, Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanks, thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Uh, I am living proof that the old axiom that if you do something poorly, you don't get asked to do it again is uh, incorrect, because here I stand. Um, I, it is my task to open to the third commandment um, from Exodus chapter 20, uh, the third word as it came to Israel. It made me wonder as I studied the text, what, what's in a name? For moderns, it's more of a handle than anything else. But, but what is it in a name? In some ways, we do understand the power of a name and taking a name in vain. Adolf, for instance, was a very, very popular name in Germany prior to the Second World War. Several notable German rulers, as well as German saints, bore the name Adolf. After the war, it's almost completely unheard of to know someone named Adolf. And the name Hitler, which was an anomaly, has completely disappeared. In fact, I read a story out of the New York Times that Hitler's siblings all changed their names, moved to the United States, and intentionally chose not to have children in order to end the Hitler name and bloodline. The name itself became associated with incarnate evil. So there is power in a name, even though it may be difficult for us uh, moderns to grasp that, that a name is more than just a handle. When we come to the text this morning, as um, others have shown, we come to really what is at the heart of Israel's covenant with God. This text of the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, the portion of the law that is central to all that Israel is called to be. Earlier in Exodus, of course, God has given his name to his servant Moses for the first time in Exodus chapter 3. And now uh, calls on the people not to take that name in vain. The first commandment sets the tone. You shall have no other gods before me. For Israel, this is to be their God, the God who delivered them, who made himself known to them, not by the four letters of the sacred name, but by his powerful actions on their behalf. He rescued them from the harsh bondage of slavery in Egypt, and he's bringing them now to the land of promise. The other gods of this world, and the world was rich in gods, were as nothing. It's important to recognize that the character of this god is quite different from all of those other gods. Um, those of you who've had the opportunity to read through the Gilgamesh epic or other things, even Homer, 
recognize the difference between the God of Israel and the gods of the ancient world who are pernicious, evil, self-seeking, glory hound jerks. <laughs> Not unlike faculty. <laughs> This, though, this is the God who hears the cry of his people in their affliction and is moved not through the desire for sacrifice or the blood of bulls and goats, but by compassion. And he moves to rescue them. And through them, he moves to fulfill his promise from Genesis 12 and rescue the entire world. So Israel is rescued, not for their own sake, but to introduce the world to this God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God whom Pharaoh says, I don't know. Well, he finds out very shortly who this God is. And so in Exodus 20, Israel is, becomes the covenant people of God. They're given the name of this God as their own. They're to be associated with him, and in doing so, they are to reflect his character, and thus they're not to take his name in vain. It is important to note that at least at some point, Israel took this seriously. In order to avoid uh, violating this commandment, they built a hedge around this name, and thus the pronunciation of the name is lost to history. Um, we have ideas that people pronounce it, but no one really knows how the name would be pronounced. Despite this, though, Israel did, in fact, take the name of the Lord in vain. In the text we just read a moment ago, Israel took that name in vain, but not in ways that we might expect. It's not that they were using the name that God had given as an oath or an exclamation. Instead, Israel was engaged in idolatry, and in misanthropy. And the people of God's name, God's missionary nation, chased after other gods and bore terrible witness to his person and his character. And despite his long suffering that you see in places like Ezekiel chapter 20, the Lord did not ultimately hold Israel guiltless. Through a series of devastating invasions and defeats, he brought punishment upon them and purified them of this blasphemy. In some ways, you know, Dr. Peterson, when we talked through uh, doing the Ten Commandments this semester, I thought, that sounds fun. Um, but it's, it's, it's not. It's difficult. <laughs> and it is difficult. Because in some ways, in contemporary world, the Ten Commandments seem so antiquated. Um, they're speaking to a different people in a different age and then, you know, I, I don't see idolatry on every corner um, unless I look more deeply. I don't see crafts, crafted stones for bowing down to and that sort of thing. And we hold pretty much nothing holy in our world today. The idea of holiness is right out. And in fact, it's funny in some ways, as I was thinking through this, using the name of God in vain is about the only thing we do that testifies to its holiness. No one says, oh my Todd. No one says, Todd darn it. There's no power in the name. But somehow there's a subtle recognition that there's something about this name. If I speak this name in an oath, there's some kind of power to that. But it is weird to try and apply these. I think though that we're reminded as Christians that in his faithful service, in his death and his resurrection and then ultimately in his glorification, our Lord Jesus has been given the name above all names. The very name of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. I can remember in my family, it was very important um, that no one ever used the Lord's name in vain. Uh, we were shocked when we heard people say, oh my God, even eu euphemistically, I, I grew up in a, a little Baptist school that took very seriously those things, and I, I got detention a few times for saying, oh my gosh, um, we don't even come close. And I think that's a good thing. It is good for us to remember that things are holy. 
It's good not to speak the Lord's name, uh, especially the name of the Lord Jesus, in a careless or an offhand way. But we must remember also that even as Israel forgot, we bear the name of Christ. Embedded in the name Christian is the Lord's title in all that we do or say, the way we act, how we treat other people, how we revere God, all of that bears witness to that name. It doesn't matter if I go my whole life without speaking the Lord's name in vain, if by my actions He is blasphemed. If the world sees through me the character of God as something other than what it is, I am taking His name in vain. If the world looks at Christians and sees us chasing after other gods, politics, power, wealth, position, whatever those gods may be, we may be assured that He will not hold us guiltless. So, even as we protect the name of the Lord and uh, remember not to speak it carelessly, let us also remember Paul's command. Whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. For we are God's image and name bearers. All that we do should be in keeping with this. How we speak to our husbands or wives, how we speak to our children, the way we care for the people around us, how we treat the helpless and the oppressed, how we comport ourselves in graciousness and love or in avarice and caprice and selfish pursuit. All of these things bear witness to our Lord Jesus Christ. And if our lives do not reflect His character and we bear His name, let us remember that we are indeed taking the name of the Lord in vain. So, as Dr. Stanglin did, it's always helpful to reverse these negative commands and make them positive. So this week, let us go forth and let us bring honor to the name of the Lord in all that we do and say.